the first thing I, I had wanted to kind of talk about as a team and just share, um, totally fine to not be as, op or be as open as you can, but immediately just for the founders here, how has this, we, I know we talked about it a little, but what immediate impacts has COVID-19 or the shutdown already had on our businesses? Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in here and start with ours. I mean, we're, we're distributed already nationwide at Whole Foods, but um, it's kind of, you know, it's, I don't know if it's lesser of evils, right? With Between like you guys that were about to do a couple of big launches, Stuart and Chloe, I know, and then a couple of these other founders, it sounds like had some big stuff in the works. Um, so for us, it's just tough because we can't support them the way that we'd want to. So if you look at it, like all of our stuff's in store. So we'd want to do in-store demonstrations and sales, in-store promotions and all that's been canceled so i mean that's been that will be an impact on our business i mean um it's an impact on everyone's business so it's it this is a great equalizer in so many ways this is um causing a lot to be equalized, never equalized before. so that's an interesting aspect of it but i mean like you guys were just saying the first thing i did was just uh understand right so especially for we're one of those um, I'm trying to just talk about time. So the most immediate impacts have been just putting down business. And then that means a lot of agencies are a lot of nice paths, but not half paths. And then how we've been responding outside of that has just been we're gonna look at any sort of VA loans that we can get, your lines of credit that we can get. So just buy ourselves maybe a couple of more months. Um, understanding that, like what we're finding from a lot of our advisors, investors, oh, like, like understand and be prepared that sales might be like flat for three months or so. So those are kind of a few of the things that we've done and just kind of trying to do whatever we can to hold on to cash. And we've got some good inventory. So that's, you know, good for us in that regard. But um, yeah, and then, like I said, I mean, we, we're diving into innovation and just understanding, I think, Anyone that I've talked to respectfully in the economic communities, everyone's saying the same thing, which is probably like 36 or so months. Um, I don't know if it's going to be that bad for that long, but I think the first and foremost thing that we're doing is just being sensitive around the health aspect of this. And then we're going to tackle the environmental or the economic aspect afterwards. And um, yeah, I think we're all going to have to just look at how we do business moving forward and, um, be more conscious about it so i mean one of the things we're doing immediately is developing a product line that's very price accessible for people um in a whole different format and it was something we were planning on doing but just being aware that for us and working on immunity um you know go look at target or any grocery store or any whole foods right now and that emergency packet is just sold out everywhere whether it's good for people or not so we're just looking at kind of you know what's going on in the macro and the micro trends Awesome. Yeah, um, I had a call this morning with, well, it was a webinar from my um, accountants, and um, there's a lot of grants um, from the government, from the New York State, and also on the government level. And there's also things about um, increasing paid leave. Um, so, you know, whoever has businesses in, in New York, you could, there's different categories, like if you have five people or less, 10 people or less, or like 50 people or less. Um, but I, I think, you know, as small businesses, you definitely should look into it if there's any ways to help um, through the next few months. Yeah. Has anybody looked into those yet? I looked I into it a little bit. A little bit. I yeah. Yeah, I was going to say we've looked, we've looked into a couple of them. Um, New York, New York, I mean, we're five people or less. You have to be in business for six months and you've got to target um, or tie revenue to like 2019 and show dips. So there's like certain requirements for grants. Um, but, or I mean, Stuart, if you have five hundred tax return for two thousand nineteen, I think that works as well. Oh yeah, that's that's a good option. I can always do that. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if anybody. I earned a little bit late to Zoom, but I don't know how many else have businesses like mine. I'm a a small firm that is lean when it needs to be and expands when it needs to be, and so sometimes I have employees, sometimes I don't. With some of the grants, it's a little challenging. Well, there's not any grants yet. There's just loans mm -hmm. so far. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm also wondering how many of the founders on here that have a sim more similar situation. Like for me, it's been a matter of like, I had sales go down because I don't sell a product. I sell m my services. Um, and those of my team 
when I have a team. Uh, and so like for the people who have a much smaller business, and I believe Nate, your business is similar um, in structure, but it's like, are anybody, is anybody here grappling with the fact that people, I'm a luxury service. And so yeah. I'm one of the first things that get cut and it's not like I have POs out, but I, you know, cause it's all through relationships and it's all through like, what are you building? What are you launching? Um, how can I help your idea come to market? And that's all on pause right now. And like you said, maybe for the next 36 months, but maybe, I, you know, that, that type of thing really affects a, a small luxury service based business like architects, like, you know, who, all of us that do these kind of luxury services, high end services. So I'm wondering if anybody else has similar things going on, what they've experienced, any insight you have on grants. I'm, I'm the exact same boat. So for us, we're like a small agency that focuses on sustainable material development um, and a lot of product design and concept. So for us, it's kind of like if there's no consumer to support, you know, buying habits for packaging or whatever it might might be, then there's no need for this kind of like luxury service, if you will. Um, but it's actually been really great in a way that it's helped us recalibrate to know like where we should be focusing. Um, and especially with materials, I think there's always going to be a need for people to still consume the essentials. Um, and those essentials are not being designed or developed sustainably. So I think like if you kind of implement some sort of, I don't know, some sort of infrastructure that allows your network to be working on these types of really sustainable projects, especially like with people, um, you know, running small businesses and, and sustainability like you guys, uh, these brands, I think, actually might come out on top. And, you know, for the short term, yeah, we might struggle. But I think, you know, after this three month, you know, kind of like bump, we might actually be more in the position to keep working on more of these types of projects, which will actually support us in the, in the long term. Um, so it's tough right now. But I think like, you're going to start to see that a lot of the, our clients, uh, or the, the clients out there are looking for innovation and sustainability at this time, because once the lights do go back on, that's, I think, the kind of need that, um, you know, small agencies and small creative practices like, like us are. Uh, and I think one of the things I want to do is to encourage the bigger, the massive companies and the billion dollar companies out there that, yeah, their sales are going to slow, but you know, for them, this is the time to look into sustainability. There's so many, especially in fashion, there's so many companies out there that have zero sustainability. And it's almost like encouraging your friends or whoever who works in those companies to look at it now and to start the work now so that when the economy's back, they're also in a place that it's, it's better for the world. Right. But they're not really spending though. That's the thing. Like they'd rather continue down this path of cheap plastic from China because China's back on so they can continue this route. Whereas, well, you know, actually something that, that's exciting is I consult for this company called Angora group right now. Yeah. And they're people, when people want to make things like they come to them to help make them because they have all the factory connections. They know where it's best to do what. And right. this is kind of proprietary, but it speaks exactly to what we're talking about. Kaiser has re reached out to them because they have a friend in common and they're like, we want to go sustainable. And we want to make things and we want to have more, we don't want to buy from distributors anymore. We want to buy directly to the, like to the, the producers, obviously masks right now are a huge thing. Okay. And cool. Kaiser healthcare, Kaiser hospital group. Kaiser Permanente. Wow. So, oh. so huge. And, and so there's an, uh, when this, the first week that this happened, I was like, here's an opportunity for you guys to be thought leaders in this. So we've been developing a curriculum to like do their own masterclass and help get a lot of these fashion companies through not only like um, supply chain breaks, but how to better make the, like they, they're just leaders in that, but they don't really do a lot of talking because a lot of us who are consultants don't have a ton of time to like rep our own businesses. So that's, I'm helping them with that. And it's actually an interesting time for them to come out on top as thought leaders here. And there's, really big people who are listening and wanting nimble agility. So in that sense, I'm helping them do that, but that's something I've positive I've seen um, with big business. I mean, Kaiser's huge. Right. Yeah, to, to go back and like answer your question from like the brand side of things, we work with a lot of consultants. Um, the way that we handled it was just like radical transparency. And, and we did it relatively early on. So we Chloe and I lived in China, so we've kind of been monitoring the COVID-19 situation a little bit longer and a little bit closer than most. Um, so, so when we kind of saw that, 
Say what? It's not a competition by any means. No. We just <laughs> we were we were like a little bit. Um, we were we were just being really proactive three or four weeks ago. Yeah, and I I think what we just ended up doing is our our strategy was like radical transparency, and we I think kind of the way that we had built our strategic partnerships was we had hedged. Um, or indexed on like good relationships with people and long-term relationships. And so um, trying to be as flexible as possible as a brand and still kind of keeping people on and, and, and talk to our PR agency as well. And I've talked to a lot of people about like 08 and like what did 08 look like and who were the people that thrived really well when there was an economic downturn and how do you sort of like take best practices there? Um, and it was what about did- building deeper relationships. Yeah, Sorry to interrupt you. I just what does radical transparency really mean? Like you show them your cash situation, and you're like, I, uh, just being super honest about yeah. Where I mean, I we didn't like pull up a balance sheet necessarily, I, I but actually speak a bit to that as as your creative partner. Yeah, I think it was about being very. You know, a lot of brands are like the word radical transparency is a weird phrase because I don't think anyone really knows what it means or utilizes it, but. Um, yeah, it's about being being very honest about the cash position because I think as an agency or a vendor or a consultant, you hear you're just unfamiliar with the cash position of a business because a lot of times it's not necessarily your responsibility to understand the cash position of a business. But um, I think in this in this instance, when you're talking about making cuts that are potentially um, detrimental to the future of the business. As the business, you do have to be very transparent about like why you're making that cut. So have an open conversation of whether or not it's a necessary cut to have. Um, so I think to Stuart's effect, yeah, it was actually it was it was all but short of like showing an Excel sheet of the forecasting. <laughs> wow. Okay. No, that's helpful. But I mean, it's radical transparency is like up to interpretation. So um, yeah. we, we literally what we did for. We, we work with probably six different agencies and consultants across everything from like accounting, PR, blah, 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 creative. And we had to put on hold uh, basically all, all agencies but one and a half. Mm. And um, we paused a bunch of projects. We pulled out of a couple contracts for retail this summer. And the way we did it is we just basically had to say, look, we don't know if this is going to be six months or 10 months or 12 months, but we need at least like you know, six to 10 months of runway in the banks right now. So that thousand fell is one of the small brands that doesn't die in the middle of yeah. May. Um, and because, you know, we just, we so believe in what we're building and, and that closed loop systems and recycling are going to be even more important on the back end. And it was just like, it, we're not, it's not ending the relationship. We're just, we need to put it on hold for three months. Yeah. It's just um, postponing it versus. Yeah, yeah. And we really, but, but to do that, we, you know, we did talk about, how much cash do we have in the bank, how much we can realistically spend monthly. Um, other things just I think that are super interesting, like we as founders paused our salary starting last month, um, but, but, but also just as at a cash position, like supply chain has been super impacted and, and also plans that we had for summer. So like everything that we, we had planned to go into a pop-up in Nolita in April that we had to pull out of. That was a huge bummer. We also were looking to sign a lease on our own pop-up shop in um, New Manhattan starting June through August, we've had to pull out of that. Um, and so, and there's like just been events and launches. We were supposed to launch with three different inter- uh, major retailers. We've had to push those back and kind of work and navigate with those partnerships, how to push those POs out. And then just this week are, um, I think some of the more interesting things I think Stuart could speak to if anybody's really interesting is on the supply chain side. One of our main component parts is manufactured in Milan. So starting about three weeks ago, well, we were, we were waiting to get, you know, $20,000, $30,000 worth of material out of Milan. That was kind of a really difficult situation to try to navigate. And then now this week, we're in the middle of manufacturing our second footwear production order and our factory um, is now on lockdown. And so we have like 900 pairs of shoes that are like half done. Um, and another 4,000 pairs of shoes just kind of on hold. And, and then on the shipping side, our, we use a micro warehouse in Manhattan. And because of the risk of two weeks ago, we started to talk down what hap- talk about what happens if Manhattan goes on lockdown and warehouses get shut. 
Stewart's had to really quickly jump and we've now have new warehouses in Brooklyn, New Jersey, and LA. Wow. So there's like, it's almost every single part of the business from like cash flow and relationship management. We also, and I think she might be on the call, but she doesn't have her video on. Uh, we also extended a first, a, a, a job offer to a first hire. We were in the middle of hiring. We've been interviewing for three or four other positions. We've had to put that kind of on hold. So we've just, there's been like every part of the business has just kind of had to shift. And then, and then the biggest thing though, that we've, we've just really tried to focus on is how can we like, what, what does, what is thousand Falls role the next two months? If it's not just like, if it's not selling sneakers and launching stores. Yeah. I think um, really quickly, this kind of almost ties back to the earlier comment around like how pausing advertising that um, Hero brought up. I think there's a couple different like buckets you kind of have to put everything in right now. And the first one, depending on your position, is obviously the conversation on how you talk to your consumer. I'd almost put as like second priority. And first priority is as an individual or as a business how do you help first? Like, right. Like how can you just think like, cause selling product right now is quite literally the furthest thing from helpful from yeah. helpful. And it's the, and it's not the, and then looking at it from the marketer's lens, trying to pry on people when they're in vulnerable positions, regardless of potentially the short term game has really, really negative and detrimental long-term effects for your brand and um, how people perceive it. Because once, I don't want to say the dust settles, because I don't think it ever will, but once we're back outside and the economy over the next 10 years is starting to pick back up and, um, or consumers are just buying again, um, non-essential items, which might be a while before that happens, um, at least the mass majority of consumers. Um, your brand will be seen as the brand that had the flash sale during Corona, right? And that's not mm -hmm. a good thing. So um, what we've been trying to do is work with all of our brand partners and understanding like what is, it really also causes you to kind of strip everything away and ask yourself, what does the brand really truly stand for? Um, everyone's got a strategy deck, right? Everyone's got their brand tenants and their brand pillars and like the keywords that a copywriter worked on them with to make up all these things that their brand stands for. And it's really in times like these where you are being tested there, because at the end of the day, if your brand can be tested via non-transactional communication, you're really truly applying your brand ethos that you have, that you've built for your brand. So, um, I think that's what we've been looking to do over the, you know, and that's just during crisis mode, right? Because it's not like, to Hero's point, it's not like we're looking at that as multiple quarters, right? Like, it's not like we're going into 2021 still pulling small businesses have to thrive and they thrive off of ultimately the community they've built supporting them. Right now is truly that time to ensure that that community, if you don't have it, you're creating it through helping them, right? And if you have it, you're tapping into them to support them in this time of need. And if you're not, and, and, and it's not that everyone has to help right now. If your brand is not in a position to help financially or from a purpose driven perspective, then it's totally fine to go quiet, right? Like uh, there was an article in WWE that was really interesting in terms of like how to market during Corona or, or sorry, how to not market during Corona and how to kind of just communicate as a brand. And um, there's a good section of it that was like, it's also totally fine by the way to just not talk about it at all. Like it doesn't have to be your brand's purpose because at the end of the, end of the day, you're fabricating a purpose and it's disingenuous and that comes back to kind of bite you later, later at a later date. But what we've been trying to do is just figure out ways to help like with, to the lens of thousand fell, it's excess inventory. Potentially those are going to get seated and go to influencers. How about they go to frontline medical workers instead that actually could use a pair of really cool shoes that um, my sister is a neonatal nurse in Texas and she sent me this moving text this morning that was like, we're recycling um, P95 masks that have blood. Like at this point, they're just like, they're blood, they don't have any inventory. So they just have to literally figure out, and scientists are figuring out how to um, desanitize these kind of by the minute. And they found out you could cook them, I guess. You can kind of cook them in this like oven and 
it'll desanitize them. But these are like bloody masks that they're like, you know, so a gift, like figuring out the purpose of the brand, whether what, through the lens of whatever product it is that you currently are making or selling and understanding like, is there a, a, is there a, a helpful perspective that we can do first and foremost? And then secondly, it's like, how can we tie in, you know, uh, to Veronica's point, like content, not everything has to be doom and gloom. Like this, people are home, they just wanna have fun. They do wanna engage in fun things. And the brand lens can be a really fun way to kind of take your mind off a lot of the challenges that people are going through on a day-to-day basis. Um, so those are kind of some of the perspectives that we're looking at there as well. That's, that's a really great point. Um, and also, Chloe, I think what you said at the very beginning about, you know, building a better tomorrow was really interesting. Um, have you guys thought about kind of like developing like a, like a strategy of what the company would look like in, in two years, you know, from a sustainability standpoint? You know, like what are the kind of systems that you guys are preparing to kind of overhaul to kind of transition from, let's say, plastic based to more like actual circular economy, um, economic systems. Cause I think one of the, I mean, right now accessibility in terms of recycled materials is, is kind of the focus focal point just because it's, it's widely available. Um, and there are systems in place for it, but like to be a leader in the space, what, what are you guys looking towards the future? How are you guys building that future? And I think if you guys have like really interesting case studies or concepts for the industry you're in, I think you could really come out on top. Um, yeah, that's and, actually, yeah. The, um, and this might be helpful for like Caroline, this might be helpful for you too, but we've taken this time to actually really do with our board. So kind of hit the nail on the head, Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. Thousand Fell, um, we've started with a circular and recyclable uh, shoe and footwear. Um, but what we've really done and what Stuart's really spent a lot of time doing is building out a back-end recycling system that once at scale, it would make the most sense to help other brands recycle in a B2B way. And so we've actually spent the past three weeks leaning into the B2B side of the business because I, I you know, and, I, I, and I, I don't want to name names, but we've been talking to some bigger and established brands in both the US and Europe about powering recycled lines and closed loop lines for them even starting early next year. Mm -hmm. Because I think even like going through a crisis like this that is, I think Veronica used the word an equalizer um, and has kind of forced us all to take a pause and think about kind of what's important, whether that be family, health and safety, and then what's important after from a consumer point of view, like what are you actually going to spend money on and care about once right. you are able to go outside and walk around again? Um, I think it's an even further push for some of these bigger companies to lean into sustainability. And then we've already seen, I don't know if they're tone deaf or not comparisons between COVID-19 and climate change, but in a sense, they are both um, equalizing crises that we're facing. And, and so we, we really have kind of accelerated that B2B side of our business. Cool. Um, and it's been an interesting time to think of, to have time to pause and think about what that looks like and how we can start that sooner. Amazing. I think for me, you know, Rodrigo, maybe we can have a side call afterwards. Like I'm super into material science. Chloe knows this, like my brand, we use a lot of material science. Cool. Um, and, um, you know, as you said, the basics, we have a puffer that's made from recycled plastic bottles. It's tied to an ocean cleanup project in, in Spain. But then we also have um, a pair of leggings made from fermented sugar. And actually one of the things that I was supposed to launch in April is, um, um, a fabric made from leftover orange peels. Um, so like there's a lot of like new and innovative materials. So even regardless of COVID, what mm -hmm. I really believe is we still need to make stuff. Yes, we need to make much less. We need to use much less, but we still need certain things. In the end of the day, we need clothing to cover ourselves. But mm -hmm. every piece of clothing that we make or every you know reusable or non-reusable water bottle that we make, it needs to be made in a way where it doesn't harm the planet. It needs to be made in a way where it's zero carbon. It needs to be no pollution, no toxic chemicals coming out. And ideally, everything should be circular and kept in a loop. And that's what um, Chloe and Stuart are pushing for so much. But I think there are examples of things that are already made that way. We have a silk shirt. Um, the way that silk is made, it, the raw materials, the mill for the fabric, and the factory is all next to each other. It's all in renewable power. Um, and it's as low carbon as you can get for a silk shirt. Mm -hmm. And um, I know for vodka, for example, I've read in Fast Company that there is a carbon neutral vodka. 
So right. if, you know, there's one or two of these products that are possible, I think there would be other things that everything should be made like that. And, you know, totally. that's really what I've always worked towards. Um, and um, besides my brand, I also do a little bit of investments. And one of the investments I made is in um, a company that can have a probiotic that breaks down plastic. So it can break down plastic where it makes it into um, biomass instead of microplastics. And right. when I heard that, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like magic. Um, and you know, they're trying to develop it so that they can work with recycled plastics as well. And um, you know, when you hear these material science technologies, I'm like, there might be some hope for us, for our mm -hmm. human race. Well, the, the really funny thing is, I think like, you know, timing and scale are one of the things that I think we've battled um, quite a lot. I used to do all the material development for Tesla on the advanced side. So really focusing on large scale production for you know, ultra sustainable materials. So moving away from plastic and thinking, okay, what's happening seven years from now? And how do we get there with kind of like you know, a step-by-step -step approach or like a short-term, mid-term to long-term? Um, and I think like what we need to do is like identify what that long-term vision looks like, but kind of work backwards and say like, what are the steps we need to do to get there to kind of raise awareness on more of a global scale? Because I think, you know, even internally at the company, you know, for instance, this orange fiber, we, we reached out to a company in, in Milan that was actually developing it. And this is maybe around three or four years ago. Um, the material is fully ready to go, but then it's like testing. Oh, does it actually go through abrasion? Does it, you know, how does it perform in the real world? So a lot of the times it's like the companies are hesitant to launch any of these projects. Um, but where we saw a lot of opportunity is developing the concept as it should be. So it's like, hey guys, here's what the future looks like. Of course, it's not ready to be put into market, but here's the material, it's real. Here's a case study here we go. It can scale because the company's, you know, looking at ramping production, they have partners in place. Um, a lot of the, the, the kind of development we've been looking at are kind of like the quote has been looking at the biofabrication age. Um, so this is where we start relying on man-made materials and looking at, let's say nature made materials. But the thing is a lot of these companies are also really hesitant to launch to kind of ruin their aura or like, you know, ruin their product. But, it's like, give it to the hands of, of the people that have the influence. Like if you give it to like a, a Nike or an Adidas, you put out one shoe and then automatically you've got this massive viral campaign of like, oh, this, you know, the shoe made out of ocean plastic, you know, that's kind of what accelerated this, um, this movement. Um, so I think like a lot of small brands right now with, with, you know, what we're doing, we're not kind of compromising our, our supply chains. If we start doing these concepts, you know, like even uh, South Thousandfell, like if you guys do an orange fiber shoe, just as like, hey, here's a case study. Um, you can use exactly the same kind of product data, but launch a shoe that's just demonstrating like where we want to be or where you guys should be. Um, and the same goes for everything. So if you guys ever need any help identifying these kind of materials or these futures, like I'd love to help um, and support yeah, you guys. Absolutely. Be that, would, that would be amazing. Uh, and, and Hero, I know that you kind of opened up with like the conversation on Koa and how you guys are talking about carbon neutrality and like the different materials that you're targeting how are you guys thinking about it from like like cpg or or like skincare side of things um probably the same as everybody else to be honest i mean i guess the principal difference between us and you guys or anybody that's primarily running textiles is that uh we probably have relatively more plastic as a percentage of like gross weight um, so I, so a little bit because everything's just fucking made of plastic, but uh, I think I think we're really all trying to race to feels. I think we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you, Hero. I'm not sure if that's just me or you guys, but it sounds like you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah, Hero, can you can you repeat some of that? Yeah. yeah uh so i don't think there's a big difference um i think everybody's racing to find better materials um both from a like do good perspective and from a um we are focused on plastic alternatives specifically because we use a lot of ldp you know um but yeah i mean I, you know i think i think it's it's basically the same 
I think, and Hero's Connection is a little bit bad. I'll jump in here with, um, you know, from my brand, we have looked into definitely plastic alternatives. Um, in my investment world, I looked at a company where they're using, um, they're making silk into a liquid material and then eventually they can put it into athletic clothing where basically it's petroleum based materials like polyester and nylon. And um, using natural silk, they can replace a lot of those properties. So, you know, there are technologies out there, but, um, and early on the call, Hero talked about carbon offsetting. So my company, we launched as a carbon neutral brand and we um, offsetted our um, pre-launch and launch activities. However, one of the difficulties of doing that was when we went to our partners, which all my factories and mills have green certifications, but some of them still didn't have exact measurements of how much energy that they're using. Um, and it made it made the carbon offsetting process actually very, very difficult. Um, you know, flights are easy to offset. Everyone can do it. Go to um, cooleffect.org and you can offset your own flights. Um, but with a carbon offsetting process, it was difficult. So I think um, what we talk a lot about in fashion is to go talk to your suppliers and then have your suppliers talk to their suppliers and keep talking up the chain and making sure every single step of the way is sustainable um, in especially in fashion, so much of the raw materials or what really happens upstream is, is not transparent. Um, and um, yeah, so that was an important thing for me. I, th I think that's in a way like the supplier has been the problem, I think, with the sustainability solution. I think if we're able to identify the solution and bring it to the supplier and challenge them, I think that's where the innovation is made. Because a lot of the times the, the suppliers don't have any interest in Kind of giving you anything more than what you need as long as you, they're just meeting your requirement right but if you have this crazy vision and you say hey you know this is where we want to be in three years otherwise you lose our business that forces them to also get their shit together so i think you really have to have like a very you know bulletproof case in point of like okay here we are now you got one year and then if you don't get or help us find a solution for this you're out and we're going to find someone else so it's like putting pressure on everybody it's not just like okay we've got a supplier it took so long to find it but I think even within this idea of sustainability, we have to really challenge what, what is possible and push the suppliers to get out of their comfort zone because they never will. You know, like if you go to China, they don't have any interest in spending months on R and D. They just want to make what you want and that's it. That's the bottom line. So I Got think it. like coming to them with actual sources, like you have to come with them with like a material source rather than like, Oh, here's this material that's been branded and trademarked, you know, that's not good enough. It's like, no, here's the formula. Here's the source. Here's the chemical company work together to develop the fiber. And let's, let's talk. And then we'll be involved in that process to make sure that it's aligned with our values, you know, and if you're not interested, we'll find someone else. So I think it's, it's really just putting the foot down and having full control of what that material vision looks like. And once you figured that out, then you can roll that into your, your supply chain and produce the product that you're after, you know? Guys, I love this combo. I wanna, I wanna table it for like the next ten minutes and and quickly shift this back to to yeah. small businesses. And we can have a whole another summit on material innovation. I think we this should day. actually, Veronica and Rodrigo, invite you both back and have a call just on material innovation. Let's do it. Yeah. By <laughs> Andras, etc. Perfect. Um, yeah, I think I think just kind of being cognizant of time, maybe the last like ten minutes or so. Um, maybe talking about kind of ways forward things people are thinking about around small businesses. I can kick it back over Caroline, if you're interested in kind of chatting or Rushi as well, like maybe it's interesting Rushi, if you're still on to kind of figure out what you're looking at as someone that's pre-launch, how that shifts focus um, and, and kind of like you got to forward. So you just, you cut out at the end, but um, if you're talking about how things have shifted focus, is that what you're, question yeah. yeah um so just to be honest we're still kind of figuring out what that looks like we're still in the process of adapting the business to this new normal so lots of events and like pop-up like mini pop-ups we had planned from now until summer sort of leading up we just had to cancel altogether. um just sort of rethinking where we're sourcing even materials like one of our component components comes from taiwan so we're thinking like how how do we become less reliant on any one vendor or source for these things and diversify our supply chain so that we don't we don't have this 
sort of dependency um, that is pushing our, our launch date forward uh, to fall. Uh, and then it's just a matter of what are the ways that we can extend our runway uh, because fundraising is just going to be all the more difficult when we're out of this. Um, and, and what does that even look like? So some people are saying, you know, six months, 10 months, 18 months, uh, we have no idea. So it's really a matter of trying to hold on to every dollar we can um, and really just try to cut uh, anything that's was leading towards revenue generation and steering towards just cash preservation uh, instead. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in here too. Having some discussions just recently with um, some of our current investors, advisors, and then some new ones. I've been asking them, I've just started kind of kicking off the conversations by saying, you know, um, what are you guys seeing from your perspective? And then if you were in my shoes, what, how, are, how, how would you be thinking through some of this? And first and foremost, what you find is that just like every single person on this call right now, everyone just wants to be heard in this season. So it's a really good way to start it with your advisors and investors and board. And, um, you know, it, it, they'll go on and on, you know, with their predictions and everyone's thoughts. And so it's actually been a really good way to kick off the conversation. Again, I mean, we're working in, yeah, I think for a lot of, um, a lot of us, if not all of us, have some sort of sustainability aspect of health, wellness, whether it's through the apparel industry, through food, bev, whatever it may be, uh, skincare. And, you know, there's a couple of things that um, Bill Gates shared. And one of the things that really stood out to me was that this is, it's kind of like all the things that this is reminding us of. And one of the things was like, this earth is sick. And, you know, just talking about that. And so, one of the things that I've done, just practically speaking, is just started drafting notes to our board and to our advisors and talking with them. But I have specifically been chatting with them and just showing them things like, because how their mind works, um, like BCG put together this amazing analysis of where people are going to be spending money when they come out of this. Um, and I think just like coming at it with like a solution focused mindset and um and then you know being very realistic as everyone else has said and buying yourself time you know it's like cash is king right always but definitely during these times and so for me i really am just like well honest like in full transparency like i the first thing i did was like okay what do we need to do to get through july no questions asked no more money in the door what what, what would it take to get through july and then now we're like working on august and september so it's just one of those things that i think you take it practically in one day at a time but um the the there is still a lot of money and funds that has to be deployed so when we look at it from a small businesses getting funded and then us being able to fund you know the important things in our business models like the right textiles which are more expensive or like the right agents who are more expensive right like the things that we do need to be able to fund i think will still be funded it's just one of the things that this is bringing out in me personally but then also in every single and i've had like i've been having like three to five investment chats a, a day so that's probably why i'm so heavy on the finance aspect of this it's kind of where my brain's been at um but one of the things that's you know been confirmed with one of the things i'm learning is people are going back to what they're really good at. They're going back to their craft. They're going back to their sweet spot, right? So if you're an investor and you've been doing like a lot of, you know, series A, but you might throw in the seed check, you're probably not going to do the seed check anymore. Or if you've been investing in kind of like health and wellness and apparel and beauty, you're probably not going to do that anymore. You're just going to go back to what you're really good at and what you know you can find some momentum in. So I've been just, you know, trying to look at that with our own products, right? So for us, we were looking at doing like target expansions and CVS expansions. And what makes the most sense is to say, hey, we're zero to $1 million right now. We can go with Whole Foods alone, zero to 10 million. There's no reason why we couldn't. Why are we, you know, thinking smarter about those types of things while still having a growth mindset and while still having a growth plan and mentality? Because, um, we need to. We all are working on important things. This is not the time that we just all go and say, well, forget it. This is the time where I think to Nate's point, we look at like, who needs masks tomorrow so that we get through the health crisis? And then how do we continue a growth mindset moving forward with these 
brands and um, products that need to exist, they deserve to exist. So I don't know, that was a lot, um, but I guess all in all, just taking it like one day and one week at a time. And um, yeah, I mean, I think all of us are gonna have businesses coming out of this as long as we take the precautions like now, like this week, do the things you need to do to preserve cash. Yeah, Carolyn, you brought up a really good point about funds and about investors refocusing on kind of what they're good at. And that's something that we've seen as well when we were going through fundraising and kind of still are. But um, there was a little bit of like craziness in the consumer venture space really early on, even before kind of COVID-19. You saw, not to name names, but you saw like poor IPOs and you saw some like, like interesting like meltdowns in some of these established D2C fitness brands um <laughs> and anyway and like block merging and acquisitions and so and so you saw people like we would have conversations with investors like well i mean how has it been raising raising money as like a d2c startup um in the retail space um and what we noticed was that the funds kind of to caroline's point that were like tech funds that had also launched like a consumer vertical were really shying away from from consumer investments but the funds that were like tried and true, like consumer funds were long consumer and were still deploying capital. Same with the funds that were like impact investing and invest investing in sustainability. And it wasn't like a separate side, sidecar, side vertical for them. Um, so I do think that people are narrowing focus a little bit too, given, given kind of the landscape, both with consumer and then now even more so with the um, 19. Yeah. I think, I mean, people are going to reshift focus a little bit, but um, again, I don't think it's a time where we're going to, as brands and as building brands and building businesses in general right now, um, we're not going to see everything disappear. I think that's, you know, a mindset that I've been trying to encourage people out of and having conversations with other founders is so helpful right now. Um, again, I think that word that's just like stood out to me is equalizer. This is an equalizer for everyone. We're all in this. Like every business right now is in this and Part of the discussion we had today, which is I should be encouraging to everyone on this call because I think everyone's kind of in, in wellness in some way, shape or form. But um, we had a discussion today around who we actually think this is going to hit long term. And that's companies like McDonald's and 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 um, some of the largest like fast food chains, because not only is it hitting them financially right now, but people will adjust the way that they're thinking about health because of this. You know, I mean, people are absolutely going to be more cautious, even if you are a mom that's shopping at Walmart um, in Arkansas, right? Which is like the, the, the demographic of people that we don't normally think about with health and wellness. But the reality is that um, this will wake people up and the sensitivity around health and wellness and hopefully to around things like plastic and our food supply and different things. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to wake people up in a big way. And I think it's going to help with um, the environmental uh, uh, different propositions that people are working on. I'm a big part of the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers, which is like under 33 year olds from all over the world. And it's one of my favorite, like, like just streams of thought right now because it is waking people up, you know? I mean, um, it, it's, this is hitting every country very differently, but everyone is in the same boat that like things are gonna have to change. So that's sort of how we're thinking about it. And at this point, just trying to be spending the time wisely with you know if you are a company raising money or or needing advice or whatever just spending the time right wisely with the right environments and the right crowds yeah that was awesome um i i guess i know that i've kind of the hosts here have been monopolizing some of this uh airtime does anybody have any other like questions that they want to kind of jump in or anything around small businesses or how businesses can help or band together like would love to open that up and and maybe spend the next maybe 10 minutes talking about that and kind of start yeah. winding up. and what you've said band together i think you know again this is even pre-covid i think partnerships um was something that was really big on my agenda i was supposed to open a pop-up in new york from March till September, and like we had lined up a couple of partnerships with various different brands, um, you know, whether it's activations in stores or, or talking about longer term partnerships of, part, um, you know, making clothes for other people or, you know, their organization or their media platform or whatnot. And I think, you know, for me, that's definitely a way of growth in the future is not just like, I think brands in the past have been 
I might rant, everyone else is a competitor, but I don't think that's how our wor world works anymore. Collaboration is key. And um, yeah, lots of partnerships in the future, ho hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart, uh, this is Demetra. We, we spoke briefly about the possibility of um, making a Slack channel within Nate's community or however best to set it up where small businesses can actually just get in touch with each other directly and just kind of share resources that they found based on, you know, wherever they're from, share marketing strategies they might have taken, um, or really just feel like they're not alone in this, you know, have somebody to speak with. I mean, even without anything specific, I think we've all seen through, through the Slack city, how uplifting it might be to be a, feel like you're a part of something when you're, when you're so isolated. Yeah. Um, I guess something that we wanted to, I mean, basically the idea was to create Slack channels for, for example, like, uh, you know, coffee shops. And, you know, what I was thinking of doing is reaching out to, you know, 10, 15 coffee shops a day, just cold calling them, telling them about it, and then having people just kind of jump in and have a dialogue going. I was wondering if, if anybody else has any ideas about that or the best way to set that up. That's Dimitri, did you run, did you launch that? Is it called Local Network Project? Is that what you, was that what you started? That's, in? that's what the, cha the channel, that, that's the channel where we can kind of discuss about that. And then, and then Nate had some very valid, I don't know if he's still in this call, but he has some very valid um, concerns about, you know, having it turn into a marketplace or something like that, or having, you know, businesses jump into the other channels and just start advertising. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw it out there to everybody see if anybody wants to join that channel and just kind of discuss the best way to go about that yeah i'd love to join nate i think is taking like a 10 minute call and may jump back on um, okay but i think um well um i have something to share about covid and like how you guys how people everyday person can help yeah um, in London, I live in London. Um, my business is in New York. It's a bit crazy, but that's the situation. Um, but in London, what has happened is everyone's like going crazy and um, buying everything from supermarkets. So it's pretty much empty. But the truth is a lot of the farms in UK supply to restaurants. And so all the restaurants are closed and there's a ton of food, fresh food, vegetables and everything that are stuck in the farms because they have no distribution method. So what my friends have done is like let's go buy more of the farm boxes and help those businesses or contact the, the farms um, directly and see if you can buy food you know with your friends or bulk and they're mostly they're willing to um, deliver um, but they just never had done it because they're just so used to delivering to restaurants um, so I, I'm guessing that's probably the case in America as well um, mm. so that's something to look I've into seen I've seen that's like on reddit like posting that they're like restaurant workers and then like they the restaurant shuts and then they take home like all this fresh fresh fruit and fresh veg from the restaurant so, like that would be great to create a distribution network could you share that on the board because i'm also from london and that sounds like such a great idea yeah hey guys after this what we'll do if anybody wants to be added to this i don't know who's here from your slack channel we have a a, a friend of the future slack channel that we can invite anybody to yeah. and then veronica you could share that link there the other thing similar to that that we've just done personally, and this is just, a, I'm in California right now, but there are a couple of um, websites already that only deliver from local farms. So we've actually been able to get produce from there, even though supermarkets are shut out. Um, one's called Good Eggs and one's called Farmstead. Um, and, and they're small businesses themselves, so it feels good to be supporting them. Today. Is it, on this note, there's also another thing that made me really, really sad. No. So I watch a lot of Trevor Noah, and on one of his clips was like, what's left over in supermarkets? And um, unfortunately, there was like frozen pizza and like some canned beans or something like that. But the other thing that was left over was Beyond Meat Burger patties. And I was really sad when I saw them. <laughs> Like, you know, after all of us talking about sustainability and all that, I'm like, why is Beyond Meat not sold? Um, but I'm guessing it's price. I'm guessing it. Yeah, it might be price. I'm also under the impression that Beyond Meat is a little bit too processed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. 
impossible to win. Does anyone else have any other questions, though, for the founders about what it's like to run small businesses at this time? I think yeah. what we'll do also is take offline. I know I've already told all the founders, but any founders that are on this call that I haven't connected yet with, we're putting together um, care package drives for medical workers in New York and California. I'm working with a couple of head nurses at Stanford and New York Presbyterian. Uh, nurses and doctors are starting to sleep overnight in the hospital so they don't infect their families. And so things like shampoo, face wash, deodorant, we're going to gift shoes. It doesn't seem logical, but when we asked, the nurses were like, it would be amazing to have a really comfortable off-duty shoe to slip into. So just things to make it feel more like home and to show that we appreciate kind of medical staff's front line. But um, other ideas, we'd, we're open, especially in the Friend of the Future channel, and incubator to discussing any other ways that brands and people can contribute right now. Um, yeah, and I think you kind of touched on it, but there is this idea of this sort of ethical component, not necessarily only, obviously, these tangible sustainability things. So consumer base. Can you hear me? You paused for a minute. Would you repeat that? Oh, sorry. I was just saying that sort of off of what you're saying, I think there's this um, connection of ethics in terms of a specifically appealing to your consumer base of what do they care about morally and how can you tap into that at, a, at this time of need? Yeah. Do you have ideas there? I think. Yeah. I mean, so I think like the sustainability thing, like it's so important and it's obviously so different, even within the wellness sector, it's so different for, you know, who is your demographic? Is it? So I mostly work with like female uh, feminist audiences. So I'm thinking about that when I'm talking to, you know, influencers that are worried right now about sort of like, how do they have a balance between, you know, talking about um, sort of like day to day things that are in their lives while also contending with this crisis and not being sort of problematic. And it's hard to draw the line unless you sort of look at it as every specific brand or like group is so specific in what their niche is and so it makes sense in general but it's also important to sort of think about those specifics which is obviously challenging as well totally i think um i think we're in a, a unique position as you mentioned that sustainability wellness these are some of the things that people are still going to care about after this crisis and so i think we're, we're trying to just figure out though like and I think we talked about this a little earlier, like when is the right time to jump back into to hosting that? And I think, I think even during this, people are home. It's a great time to kind of have put on pause and think about what we really care about and what we want to see afterwards. Um, For sure. So that's kind of how we're approaching it. And I think maybe even tomorrow, Kate, Kate is here. Kate, Kate runs all of our creative programming. We might launch just like a thousand step challenge just to, to kind of be there with our community and think about ways that like, well, people are home alone, like we can still be engaged. But um, I don't know, I think it's for, for us, it's like the, the question is not that we're going to move away from sustainability messaging at all. It's just like, how do, when and how do we make that like the, the first message again versus just being a community right now? Exactly, for sure. Any other uh -huh. questions? Hey, I just wanted to say this, this has been really informative. Um, I run a not-for-profit and an agency uh, based in Canada and the U.S. Um, the not-for-profit is dealing with education and the agency is on the brand side. But a lot of what we do uh, is transfer that knowledge back and forth from educating our public and our consumers um, to educating uh, the corporations and the businesses. Um, we generally work with bigger tech companies like Twitter, Microsoft, Google, um, and kind of help build their corporate education and their corporate architecture and kind of shift that generally stemming from what we do with our, in our classrooms. So we have a curriculum and a, and a school we built in Canada, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that I'm looking at and just kind of, it doesn't have to be here necessarily, but uh, wanted to propose an idea of, I think the biggest benefit, um, Matt, Matt Rowing from Matt Projects is who told me about this and, and, you know, I'm happy he clued me into this community. But one of the biggest things is kind of all these small businesses and particular uh, creative agencies coming up with ways that we can build some sort of new corporate education on what it means to support small business and the importance of that for their corporations going forward. Because I think a lot of that um, budgets and money that they've been, they've been allocating and withdrawing right now, they're doing so because they're also worried for where their money is going to go. But right. the understanding that all of us uh, collectively are necessary in that supply chain for them in reaching the consumers when this thing ends is going to be a really important part 
of of building whatever this looks like coming out of this. Yeah. Um, and we work a lot as well with sustainability. You know, we work with Alix and Matthew Williams, and and have been talking to his his prod, uh, producers and his supply chains about what it means to be sustainable right now, especially in Italy, where most of his manufacturing is built. And a lot of what we're seeing from people is what we need kind of right now is a lot of these creative thinking and strategists to begin the process of re-educating these companies as to what consumer consumers need right now, right? And we're talking about that front care uh, hospital workers and the healthcare practitioners. That's one part of it. And then the other part of it is how do we keep these businesses afloat by accessing other budgets and other um, revenue streams that these companies have? So I just want to table that as, as something, but I'd love to hear more about that because we want to design kind of educational briefs that we can send to our partners and then also make that, you know, public that other people can share with their, um, their corporate partners and their clients about ways that we can kind of look to keep a lot of these smaller agencies and small businesses afloat. That'd be great. It, it might make sense to just kind of host another one of these to focus on that and have it be kind of a brainstorm. Um, and if you want to come on and like lead that, I, I know you mentioned Matt as well. Um, yeah. That'd be great. I think that'd be, I think that'd be really well, I think great. actually to have one about like, just like, I think Rodrigo, we're signing you up for like two different calls after this. Like one about material science, one about agencies and just have one with like Nate and like mm -hmm. everybody in the chat that runs an agency and what, how agencies can contribute and what they should be doing during this time. Cool. Um, and then I also like love the idea that you work on education um, and it would be interesting to find a time to have a conversation about sustainable education, both on the consumer level and the B2B level. Um, we had two calls this morning on the B2B side, trying to talk to bigger brands about the importance of building closed loop systems. Um, and both times we got asked like, well, what does circular really mean? And we're like, meh, we're like, we're really, it's just, it's, we're really early on that um, bell curve. Um, and so it's an interesting time to even be kind of talking about circular and sustainable education. Yeah, I mean, we we built the agency out of the not-for-profit. So we hire 100% of the kids who come through our school and put them to work in an agency to support their their creative pursuits. Um, so our sustain our closed loop sustainability is something that we've shown works to these bigger companies yeah. by putting kids that they so they they paid for the classes. Everything's free that we do. So their yeah. sponsorship paid for the classes. Kids go through the classes kids get hired by the agency, the, those kids then start working on projects for the clients. They literally see the whole closed loop of where their support goes. Cool. Um, so when you talk about radical transparency, we've been super upfront with that. You know, like we are willing to work with brands when other educational institutes maybe are more afraid to do that because we understand the need to keep this funding open and to keep the platform open. So I think like, like uh, something that we can, we can all benefit from uh, myself and our organization included is keeping that dialogue going f within the creative community and within the brand side. Like I'd love to help uh, brands, you know, small brands, small businesses. I've heard from a bunch in this call talk about what that looks like, you know, what their business models look like, sharing that information. Like to me, the radical transparency right now is like all of us are not going to come out of this unscathed. So any kind of like trade secrets, quote unquote, that we have right now, it's really silly to keep those inside because we literally need all of us to keep that moving. Exactly. So whatever that education platform between businesses, you know, we have a whole team that builds curriculum. Um, we have, you know, yeah. professors and stuff that work for us. So if there's any kind of support we can offer on that way, I'd love to, again, speak off copy or going forward about things like this are super important, right? And we're seeing it not just from established creatives, but those coming up as well. I'd be really interested in seeing like, you know, what, cause I think the circular economy or like the idea of being circular um, by definition or like um, let's say functionally speaking, there's always a waste stream. So there's always like 99 or I think it's like maybe 98% of that circularness, um, you know, performs. So there's 2% that's like waste and that's just natural cause that's just how nature operates. But there's a case study within that kind of that waste stream um, where I think there's a lot of opportunity to figure out how, you know, if we're not, if we're still using plastic and we just naturally have 2% continuing to pollute the planet, 
how do we kind of evolve this kind of like circular strategy into something where there is never, it's all a hundred percent, you know, like do some sort of workshops or maybe do some research or case studies or put together some sort of plan that's like, you know, guided by the creative community that has also like an output at the end where we're continuing to practice our theory in a way. So like education workshops, I think is a really cool way of really understanding like, okay, we know what the problem is, but deep within that problem, there's an, a secondary problem. And I think we kind of don't know enough about that. So we try to focus on what's the most apparent, but trying to figure out, you know, for more of a long-term strategy, what that looks like and how we can prevent, you know, we love to collaborate with everyone in this chat. Like we're currently, you know, most of, most of what we were doing is, is offline. We hold events, you know, draw between two to 500 people to all of our events. We fly people oh. in to speak in Toronto and then we hold them in New York and LA and other places. But right now we're trying to digitize that whole, you know, we had six months of programming laid out. What does that look like in a digital sense? You know, we always right. wanted to put learning, but now there's been like a fire lit under us. So yeah. again, I'm really, I'd love to collaborate with other people in this to figure out what kind of lessons and kind of like thought processes we can get out to people because innovation isn't going to stop, right? Like that's not, that's not something you can turn off. And I, if anything, I think it's going to grow now. So how do we like build that architecture and that infrastructure to help support that innovation, I think is super important. I'd love to share some trade secrets with you guys. So. We should plan an education call. Yeah, I agree. Um, I love that. I love it. I'd love to learn more also about how you're thinking of having these conferences in the digital space. Yeah, me too. Yes, I have some resources on digital facilitation that I can share with you guys. So definitely post it up on the Slack channel and I can post it there. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. If anybody, if anybody's not in it and wants to be in it, I open, I just like, ask for everybody's email on uh, on the, the chat. chat and we'll add you to the channel now I'm just copying everybody's emails down now and then i can just add you guys in and if you're already in the chat then i can at least add you to the channel is that for the the innovation incubator slack or for the ones you guys were talking about about the future of um we just I made think. um we just made friends of the future under innovation incubator oh so okay. that's doing these calls with like small business founders can all talk um and we like started it with environmental lens, but it doesn't have to be. But I think a lot of the people like Rodrigo and uh, how do, Joachim, I'm sorry. Uh, are all, it's Joachim, sorry, Joachim. Joachim, sorry. Are all, are, all in the, are all in the larger innovation incubator, but oh, okay. I, there might be another channel for education already. I'm not sure. You can do I don't it know. This so our, our, our purpose is we want to try to plan like twice a week group calls and then always have a different topic. Um, that's what we were thinking of starting. Yeah. All right. Well, add that channel to the um, friends from the future one, if that's possible. Yeah, Claire, definitely. Are you, are you, are you already on the Slack channel? Yes, I am. All right. I'll just, I'll add you in. It's really easy. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining. Me. I um, this has been really great. Um, and we can we'll keep everybody updated through the through the Slack group and then through our Insta as well. And and this is awesome. This was like beta test one, super super popular. Really like thirty people at one point. So um, the next week, just to let you know, uh, Kate, I don't have any idea on the day, so I'm gonna have to start out there. Probably Sunday or Monday. We're gonna do an, an AMA with um. Tom Zaki, the founder of TerraCycle, just to talk about recycling and waste management. So we'll post that probably in the larger channel as well. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. Bye. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining on a Wednesday. I hope you're all healthy and safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.